my name is Marlene Bras, as Rina most likely already told you. Thank you, Jana and Rina, for the invitation to speak here today. I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Um, I saw in the program that it said Circular Amsterdam. For some people, that always is a disappointment because I don't work for the city of Amsterdam. I actually work for the Amsterdam metropolitan region. Um, and in that respect, I also find it very interesting to be here today because this is the region of Helsinki and uh, we might be, be able to have a discussion on how we approach the circular economy in the Netherlands, in the region, and how you do this by yourselves. Okay. Um, what I will be doing, this, this, th this is my crazy presentation, and I said, do I need to explain to anyone what circular economy is? And the answer was no, you don't at all. So um, what I will do, I will move immediately to the part of the presentation that explains how we work. I work for the Amsterdam Economic Board, which is an independent institute that focuses on the future of the Amsterdam metropolitan region. So we say if you want to live and work and spend your free time in the Amsterdam metropolitan region in 2040, the future, then we need to address a couple of things in the region starting today. And a couple of those things are, for instance, how you deal with mobility, how you deal with the digital connectivity, how you deal with talent. A lot of people that are being born these days will actually be working in jobs that don't yet exist. But also how we deal with our resources. We, in the Netherlands, but also in Europe, we import quite a lot of materials and resources. Then we, if we're lucky, we produce something. Sometimes we even import products. And after use, we Throw them, away, throw them away, and in the Netherlands, we burn what we have. So we create electricity. So that's how we deal with the, mostly with our resources these days. And we say we can be smarter in this. So the Amsterdam Economic Board works on talent of the future, mobility, digital connectivity, and the circular economy. That's the topic that I'm responsible for. And the Amsterdam Economic Board is an independent institute funded by municipalities, by knowledge institutes and by the business world. So we have about 150 partners. 60% of the funding comes from government and 40% comes from the knowledge institutes, which is uh, also the universities as well as, um, as the business. We set a mission together with 32 municipalities, two provinces and our other partners. And the mission is that we said, okay, at least in 2025, we would like to be the smartest in the world with regard to how we deal with our resources. Clearly, if you look at circular economy, you have to look way beyond the 2025. You have to look at 2040 and 2050. The national government has set the target for 2050 to be 100% circular. That is the national target. And within the region, we have set up the program already in 2015 to start working on this. From within the board, we focus on two themes within circular economy. So it's the energy side and it's the material side. And today I will be mostly talking about the material side, but I thought it would be interesting to address at least that we work on residential heat programs, uh, that we work on valorization of CO2 that's now being emitted into the air, and that we work on energy transition in the built environment, all in public-private partnerships. So everything that we do within the Amsterdam Economic Board, we work on um, cooperations between the business, knowledge institutes, and governments, because that's, the, that's the, 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 the philosophy that we use, that transition, transitioning into something new needs a cooperation. I've heard it a couple of times already this morning between all the different actors involved. The most important program that I will be talking about today is our resource program. Um, and in that respect, we focus on two tracks. One is circular design. So you have to redesign your current system. And we focus on that through the circular procurement. And I will go into that more into more detail uh, later on. And the other one is that we say, OK, we have to address the current waste streams and make those more circular. There's a lot of debate on this because people say, not anymore, but at the beginning, because people said that if you, if you look at it from a waste perspective, it could as well be linear plus instead of circular. 
whilst we say, okay, the transition into a different kind of economy where you keep your materials and your products in your circular system as long as possible will take decades. And for the status quo, what we have today is still a lot of waste streams. So why don't, you, why don't we start utilizing those waste streams instead of burning those? So those are the two tracks that we, that we work on in the, in the program. In 2015, the board works with, uh, as I said before, 150 paying partners, but we also have 20 CEOs and old ministers that, um, that work with us on the urban challenges that we, that we address. One of those that is specifically uh, dedicated to circular economy is our old minister of environment, uh, Jacqueline Kramer. And Jacqueline Kramer in 2015, um, she started off an, uh, a tour in the Amsterdam metropolitan area visiting mayors and vice mayors and civil servants to address that circular in economy had to be put on the agenda. I don't know whether you were earlier than 2015, but in 2015 in the Amsterdam metropolitan area, within the different municipalities and the programs, circular economy was not yet really a big topic. But what we see today is that it really has a lot of traction, not only within the governments, but also uh, within business and knowledge institutes. So we see that we have a momentum at the moment in the Netherlands, but I think worldwide, that people start to understand the uh, necessity and the urgency of transitioning into different kind of thinking and different kind of economy. But in 2015, this was quite new. So in 2015, she did the round and again and again, which resulted in an um, agenda in June 2016 with an agreement from 32 municipalities in two provinces that we will be focusing on the adaptation of circular procurement and initiatives starting on the um, recycling of eight to nine uh, resource streams, waste streams, material streams. There's m plenty more, but we said those are the most important um, to focus on in the first years. So, how do we work? I already mentioned it a little bit. The, um, what we say is within, for system transition, you need all the actors in the field. So everything that we do is always around cooperation between those three different parties. This is a bit of the transition philosophy that we use within the Amsterdam Economic Board, but also within the programs that we have, and is that we say the current economy, which is, I don't know whether you can read any of this, but the current economy uh, is a very strong one. It's dominated by fossil. It's dominated by, in the Netherlands, burning waste to produce electricity, which for a long time was a good thing to do. We even imported waste. But now we know that you can you know, put higher value to your waste streams and reuse and remanufacture and recycle before you actually consider even burning waste. But it's a very strong economy that is the status quo. So it's difficult to change what the status quo is. So what we say, what we do in our program is that we put more and more emphasis on the new, the better, the new ecosystems, the experimentation, uh, working on the alternative towards the existing uh, fossil-dominated economy. And at some point in the future, those lines will cross and the new economy will prevail. But that takes a while. So in the meantime, we always partner with the existing economy to assure that we have strong partnerships. So we ask the waste incineration companies to join us and invest on the new, new experimentation routes. So we set the tone, we set the vision from within the board. We have the programs on the different uh, waste streams and we initially, uh, and that's the most important, new ecosystems, new partnerships, and I've heard it a couple of times already, new partnerships, new ecosystems to actually get things going. So that's the way we work. Region. Why would we focus on the region? We have Amsterdam, we have Almere, we have very small municipalities, but also very large ones. And we say in the region you need to cooperate because scale is very important. If you want to make a transition possible, you need to work on volumes. 
So if you look at what waste is being produced, how you can valorize it, everything needs volume. So working together on setting standards, on creating volume, and working on procurement is, is very important. A change into a different kind of economy uh, requires certain conditions. And metropolitan regions, like this one, have those conditions. So you have a harbor, you have a good logistical network, there is a, a lot of knowledge institutes, there is a sustainable entrepreneurship. So you have all the conditions actually for change. So we set, we set up well, but now we have to coordinate. Oh, this is um, unfortunate, but uh, how do we work? We selected nine different way streams to work on, and the Amsterdam Economic Board works on three different layers. One is we work on the supply side very closely with the municipalities, who obviously have the responsibility to, de to deal with residential waste, and sometimes even commercial waste, to collect it, to process it, and to ensure that everything is being done according to higher standards more and more. Then we say we have to, once you've got waste that you don't burn anymore, you have to find the alternatives. So we work very closely on providing that alternative and putting coalitions and new ecosystems together that actually address uh, and actually work on uh, valorization of diapers, textiles, the built environment, biomass, to do something different than the alternative, which is burning. And then you have the demand. We say, if there's no demand for any product or service that you create, then clearly no one is going to invest in producing anything. So all of them are very important. With the supply side, as I said before, we started in 2015, but it was, it was difficult because, as you can imagine, every city considers themselves or every municipality considers themselves as the most important. So they look at themselves first before looking at cooperating with other cities. That was, at the, at the start, a very difficult one. It took, since 2015, up to actually September, October last year, for people to get used to the idea that some decisions with regard to waste and resource management were no longer going to be taken on a municip municipal uh, level, but more on a regional level. So that was, I think, one of the very difficult parts, and our role in there is that we have, we obviously from the Amsterdam Economic Board, we are an independent, independent partner that is able to address issues like you have to cooperate together, and you have to work on your standards together, and you have to produce volume together. And the other is the upcycling bit. We say, if you have all the different waste streams, and in this case, these are the ones that we selected for the first three years, then to create activity on those different waste streams, you have to ask front runners, people who want to do different, to actually participate on this. So we introduce people and we create new ecosystems of parties that say, okay, we feel and we see that there is actually money to be earned in valorizing diapers. So what we did is we uh, selected a couple of uh, technology providers, introduced them to the current and existing uh, waste incineration company, and said, okay, now you burn tons and thousands of tons of diapers each year, but you could do something different. And they agreed and they selected one supplier and now they have the cooperation with this supplier, with Procter & Gamble, and themselves to start a demonstration scale in the harbor on valorizing diapers into cellulose, plastics, etc. And once that is being found okay and runs smoothly, they're going to upscale to commercial scale in 2020. But the waste incineration company never had thought about doing something different than burning, because obviously, if your current business is incineration, then the alternative is often not, in, uh, not really in clear view. So for each and every waste stream, what we do first is we get together experts and we gather insights, whether that's through studies, uh, through talking to experts, 
to, to market evaluations, we first get the insight, okay, okay, what's the status quo if you look at the textile market? Who is involved? What are the different actors? What could be different? Where, is the, where does the loss of value in that specific value chain actually sit? And usually, no one actually feels the loss of value because the loss of value often is the loss of material because you know, everyone has their own business model within the existing chains. But we show people where the loss of value is, and then people say, okay, we would like to do different, so we bring together parties who would like to do different. And we've got 150 partners, and there's always one corporation, a Philips or a, Sch or an, a Schiphol, who wants to do things differently, so we use that network to actually get people to, to, to be mobilized. And then we set up an action plan and put those people that do things differently and start initiatives. Halfway through? Is that, yeah, thank you. Uh, on, the, on the stage. To give you two examples, because this is all pretty high over. What we have done last year is that we noticed that for the clippings, the mowing of the, of the, of the public areas in the Amsterdam metropolitan region, that there used to be a business case to take the grass and put it under the ground and let it ferment, but that's no longer the case. So the people who used to do that business, they wouldn't earn anything. At the same time, what we often notice is that people would let the clippings sit on the ground, whilst there is also the alternative, and that is using that biomass to produce a product that, use, that, could, that normally would use fossil as a basis. So in this case, we said, okay, we have clippings, lots of it, so, and we have technologies that can actually process those clippings into usable vi fibers. And there's lots of companies and technologies that actually use those fibers to produce um, products. And in our case, insulation material. So the first thing we did was we provided the Port of Amsterdam, who have an ambition to create a circular cluster and work on circular economy themselves. We pro uh, provided them with, a, um, with an array of technology providers that could potentially address the clippings. And then we got the province on board with the volumes, as well as uh, the water boards and a couple of other large uh, producers of clippings, together with um, the, uh, the, the producer of uh, biological uh, insulation material and negotiated them towards a letter of intent in eight months. Then they put money together to provide for a program manager to work on LCAs, to work on the quality, etc. And now they're working towards an investment decision on a large scale production facility of insulation material from clippings. And another thing that we've done is in the Amsterdam metropolitan area, we have a large density of data centers, which is good for business. We have the AM6, which is um, a cable coming into Europe in, in the region. So we have fast internet. And what we notice is that that business also causes obviously a lot of energy drain, but I'm not talking about that. But the other one is that we notice that 183,000 data servers are being disregarded on a yearly basis, and 80% comes in the hands of traders, 65% goes abroad, and then we have no real um, control of what happens next. Whilst the best thing you could do is refurbish and reuse as soon as possible, or um, get the materials out, or recycle, and preferably within the region. Don't let it chip everywhere. So the first thing is, what we did is we put together a consortium of parties, actors in the chain that wanted to do different. Then we ha gave them all the insights of what, could do, what they could potentially do differently. And then we provided them with uh, the perspective to do things differently. And a lot of what people could potentially do different is that once you start thinking about your data management, you could look at performance, but also um, in your procurement, you can already address what you would like companies to do with your data servers after end of use. So you could say, I would like to get business. And now we're getting business into the MSA metropolitan area 
who are able to refurbish locally instead of bringing it abroad. Okay, so over the past years, we have had cooperations and new ecosystems on those various, um, um, various waste slash resource streams. So what we always do, we work on supply, we work on the business, and we work on the demand. And we celebrate successes in, the me in, in, in between because you know, transitioning into a new kind of economy is a long, it takes a long time. And people always say there's nothing moving. But there's quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of movement. It's just that it's not that visible. And the mindset is changing, cooperation is changing. And what we've noticed is that we have set up new cooperation coalitions on those different waste streams over the past uh, year. And we're still working on it for new waste streams. And one of the most important things um, that we have been working on uh, together with our partners over the past years is procurement. Procurement, procurement, procurement. Because all partners, uh, governments, as well as business, as well as knowledge institutes, have the tools to actually do things different and demand that things are being done differently. And that's true procurement. Five billion euros of goods are being actually bought each year by the municipalities in the Amsterdam metropolitan region alone. So if you only do a small percentage, we say, then you will have that demand that drives the innovation and the business that drives that people will do things differently. So in this year, we set up a couple of communities of practice, which is learning communities where people in small groups, 15, 20 organizations, learn in eight months how to do things differently. And it's a closed environment, so it's, it feels very comfortable for people to share because change is mostly organizational. Everything is already possible, but people think it's impossible, that management is against, that they don't have the time. Whilst working on new way of procurement, as you all know, is just you have to invest time at the start, but then it pays off. And there's not a catalogus that offers all kinds of circular products yet. So you have to start talking and diet, having your discussions and your market consultations with the possible providers of furniture or uh, of light within, um, within the chain. So that will cost time and, and, and effort. But we help people to be more comfortable to do it. And at the same time, we have our senior managers of all the members that we have to uh, approve and agree upon um, that people actually spend time doing things differently than they used to do before. So what we agree with them and also uh, is that they at least or one or two projects for this year do differently. That they include the startup scene because it's very difficult for them to actually join the procurement process. So we, we ask them to uh, include the startup scene as a subcontractor. Not as the main contractor, but as a subcontractor. So that everyone gets a fair chance of actually contributing to this change. We also made, because the first argument was we don't know who they are. So we, we made visible who the starting scene is on the different product, uh, product groups. And we showed it to them and we organized matchmaking events between the procurement officers of all the institutions and the startup scene. And then by now we have got quite a lot of partners that say, we find circular procurement so important that we would like to mobilize others as well, our customers, our suppliers, to do things differently. So we have started this mobilization trajectory of, mo of circular procurement in the region, um, leading to, but not the end result, a um, state of the region large festivity with 600 change makers and CEOs, etc., of the region on the 20th of June, where about 40 different contracts are being signed in a circular way to show that, you know, this is possible, it's not easy, but it's possible, and that people can actually join this kind of movement. So our philosophy is always work with the front runners, and then more and more people will join, and at some point you will, you will be the lagger and the lagger will be the loser in the new system. So by inspiring others that things are possible, we actually create a movement in which we actually don't need to invest any money ourselves. It's always the partners on the different businesses that do the investments. Yeah. And as you can say, 
it's change, it's change management. So it's always difficult, but by using front runners, you, you also address most of the issues that we come across, like vested institutional interest. Some people have earned money by the current economy. So it's normal that you would, you would have them against you. Uh, people also think, you know, behavioral, that things are not possible. So you show them that things can be different. Uh, technical, I believe that everything is already feasible, but you know you have to provide for experimental room within your pro pro program for people to actually be able to. So we do that as well, that people show, okay, it is possible to, to use certain grasses and fibers to create insulation material. And then people say, oh. And it needs a certain type of, uh, kind of people. I often get the question, how do you get your job? Or uh, wh what do I need to do to be involved in a circular economy? I, will, uh, I go to university as well, once every two months, and give a lecture. And there's always a couple of students that think, I want, I want to work in the same business. Um, but, but, but the business itself is um, working on this kind of fields. We, I heard it before as well. It's, we don't know what it is, what it will be, the economy in 20 or 30 years time. The only thing that you really know is that you need to change what it is at the moment. So what you do, you have a, a, a focused approach of, okay, this is where we wanna go. We wanna go to 100% circular economy in 2050. 50% um, in 2030. Uh, we would like to have 100% circular procurement in 2030. So we have all those goals, and then you put the path to get there with your partners out there. But it's an agile approach. You, you, you move and you change along the way. So it's, it's difficult and it's different, but by showing that it's possible, we actually... Uh, uh, Rina, I see you look like you want to ask a question. <laughs> no? <laughs> Yeah, okay. How much more time do I have got? Because I've got a couple of more question, um, examples. Okay. Any questions so far on our approach of how we approach um, the transition and how we work together with our partners? Nothing that we can't address yet? Okay, then I would like to go to... Um, let me see what it looks like. There are some nice examples that um, we already see happening uh, worldwide, but also in the, in, in the region. It's a bit complementary to what we've just seen. And one is, one, one is the example from Schiphol. Schiphol, um, which also shows that it's, it's a matter of changing the system. Schiphol used to buy light bulbs, you know, the ones that you put in the, in the ceiling and you've got light and buy electricity from a different source. That's what they used to do. And at some point Schiphol said, I don't actually need light bulbs, and I don't need to buy electricity separately. What I actually need is light. So they went back to Philips and the electricity provider and said, instead of providing me with light bulbs and electricity, I just would like to buy the service light. And in that respect, what happened was very remarkable because a couple of things happened. One was that Philips and the electricity company, Philips is a producer of light bulbs, Philips and the electricity company started working together on an offering for Schiphol. And by doing so, they noticed that the, uh, the, the usage of light, uh, electricity, light, was 35% less than before. And that's because Philips had to provide light bulbs themselves and made them more efficient all of a sudden. So that was possible. And they, they, they lasted longer. So by not buying the property, the ownership, by not owning lights, Schiphol, the light bulbs, but by um, rendering the services, a couple of interesting things happened. A, the light bulbs were all of a sudden very efficient. So there was like 35% less usage. They lasted longer. And after the end of use, they would return to the Philips factory and they would reuse most of the material. Whilst previously, 35% more electricity was used, the light bulbs didn't last that long. And Philips uh, and Schiphol had to replace them themselves. 
So by just looking at this from a different angle, a different business perspective, all of a sudden more was possible than previously announced, which is quite interesting. The other one is diapers. Um, I already talked to you about that briefly. We uh, introduced a couple of um, technology providers to the waste incineration company, and they selected one that can actually has a technology that uses the plastics out of diapers, the cellulose out of diapers, and the poo for biogas production instead of burning it. And this is a company that uses um, the, the, the peels, uh, the, the skins of oranges, to, pr to produce already on large scale uh, shampoos and soaps. So they use the, uh, the, arom uh, the aromatics from the, um, from the orange skins to produce soaps, instead of using the paraffins. So you pr replace the oral alternative. And the interesting thing they always told me is that, they told me is that um, when they use the oranges from Eco Plaza, which is an organic shop, their soap smells differently than when they use the oranges from one of the larger supermarket chains that obviously use pesticides. So it was definitely it is definitely a difference in use. So you come across a lot of additional knowledge and benefits whilst you dive deeper into different business models. And this is quite an interesting one, but this is already an example of 2008, and we haven't repeated this since, which is funny because this is a project in which a housing company, social housing company, said, okay, we need to rebuild um, or, uh, or building. But we would like to do this in a socially responsible manner with um, eye for environmental impact, etc. So what they said, instead of writing out a usual tender, we actually do a market consultation in which we tell people that we would like to have a zero emission uh, building, that we have, we'd like to reuse our material, and that we'd like to do this as sustainable as possible. So they wrote out a tender after the market consultation, and it says that we would like to be a partner in this consortium in which we, they said that, in which we would like to share the, the gains and the risks. And if we do it, uh, if we perform better than we used to do before, then we have a, ben uh, have a bonus that we would like to share amongst our partners. So we would like to be equal partners. They had five uh, applications, consortia, uh, applying for this. And it was also the very traditional build industry. And the traditional build industry scored very low because they put very much emphasis on price and timing and not so much on material reuse. But there was a, a consortium that um, you know, addresses this partnership, the shared res risks, responsibilities, and the re reuse of material as such, that they won the um, uh, application. And as the partnership was so important, they managed to uh, rebuild and redo the whole project 20% in 20% less time than anticipated, under budget, so all of them got the bonus, and reusing most of the material that they actually demolished at the start, just by smart demolishment. So this tells me that if we did this in 2008, we're very much aware and we're very much able to do this in 2018 as well. It's just a matter of you know, asking the right questions and then forming a partnership to do so. And I've got a couple of more Beautiful example of how things work. I saw this um, example of using um, uh, food waste streams um, from you know, uh, industrial symbiosis. Uh, what we notice there is that you, know, you can use the waste streams, the food waste streams, in processes and, and upgrade it into um, aminosure, uh, um, aromats, etc. The only difficult being that if you buy those um, uh, waste streams from a supplier, that once the supplier notices that you are making money with their waste streams, then the prices go up. So one company that we uh, helped uh, form a coalition said, okay, if that's the case, then I would like to start a cooperative with the producers of food. So they are also a shareholder 
of you know whatever we do we're going to do with them so they have no incentive of increasing prices once this turns out to be successful so in that case uh, they have a consortium a, co a cooperative of 12 partners that all invest in an upcycling facility that processes uh, waste streams from the food industry into amino sewers because there's a quite a lot of um, market potential for, uh, for the output. It's a world market. But the only problem that was hindering them is A, the price of waste streams, once people do something, uh, add value to it. And the other one is that the companies find it very difficult to share information. I'm sure that you find, it, find that as well. That some people find it difficult to share information on what their waste streams actually entail. What, what's in the waste stream, because that gives information on how your business and your processes, your operations are being run. So, so we're now working on a large um, um, uh, project in which we ask the market to, um, for a price, a competition, we ask the market to um, come up with a solution that addresses um, the anonymity uh, the confidentiality issues that people have whilst showing what waste streams they have. Because if we want to make this work, we have to be able to see what's out there of, you know, of other, other companies to use. And if we don't have access to that information because people feel that by giving that data away or information away, their business, is, uh, business continuity is being jeopardized, then we, uh, then we clearly won't get any far. But there's luckily different technologies like blockchain, etc., that will anonymize your information. So we're now putting out a competition in the market by the end of April for, the good, for, for a solution to address that we would like to open up all this data for everyone to use and then see how this is actually uh, going to work out. I will leave it at that. Thank you.